This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Lately, I think I've been way too in my head, paranoid about the things around me and not focusing on what's right in front of me. I cling to my past, I cling to what's comfortable, and I don't know how to let go. I'm so desperate to keep the things that make me happy close to me. I'm too scared to think about what might happen if I change. I'm just not ready. I, I just don't know. But what I do know is that Monster House is a good ass movie, man. This movie is one that I covered nearly six years ago, which which just holy crap I'm getting old. But when I first made a video on this movie, I don't think I truly did it justice with just how much I appreciate it. It's a movie lost in time, not really talked about as much anymore because, well, to a lot of people, it just really isn't special. I mean, it's hard to say that the animation is held up when it looks like this. Things are muddy, characters lack detail, I mean, this child is so ugly I nearly threw up on rewatch. But despite this, there's an unspoken charm that comes with all of this. A warm feeling found in the limitations of the old technology and a genuine passion that's shown in the way that it's used. Characters like DJ, Jenny, and Chowder may be just basic children without much going on with them to care about, but it's the uncompromising dynamic that it pushes forward that I really, really love. In this movie, kids are simply kids. They make up fantasies about creepy neighbors that no one believes because why would they? I remember doing that all the time, focusing on the things that my parents ignored and creating massive stories in my head because things were just easier to explain that way. When it came to reality, things were always much scarier than what you ever imagined. Monster House takes place around Halloween night, with trick-or-treating on the horizon leading for the ultimate Halloween feel. Opening with the fall of an orange leaf, we watch a little girl on her tricycle with the utmost naive whimsy that any kid would have. She lets this whimsy get the best of her when she runs her tricycle off the sidewalk into the grass of an ominous and seemingly abandoned wooden home. The leaf that was following her beautifully floats past her before being turned around to show us the broken parts of the sidewalk that lead into this home. This makes you question, did she really run herself off the sidewalk or did something lead her to get stuck? As the little girl tries to get her trike off the grass, the door of the home opens to a scary old man in the shadows. He goes by the name Nebercracker, which is a pretty funny name for an old man. The old man runs at the girl and yells at her to get off his lawn. He even says, do you want to be eaten alive? Which as a kid, you're like, oh my god, he eats people, he eats people, that's crazy. It's a really great red herring. The girl runs away and he takes the trike inside and as he looks back, we hear a picture taken. We as the audience become this point of view from a camera watching this man do scary things with his deadly stare as we fast punch right through a telescope to meet DJ. We see how DJ is obsessed with Nebercracker, taking notes of everything that he's done in the last couple months. And some of these photos give me the shivers. I mean, geez, uh, I'm scared. This whole intro is a great setup for DJ's obsession. His imagination runs wild. Why is he taking things from Kid? Why is he so off-putting? Who is this old man? There's rumors of him killing his wife, which is dark and an interesting story for essentially a kid's movie. DJ runs downstairs to tell his parents about Nebercracker, but they, of course, just brush it off. And while this might be all you see of the parents for the majority of the film, their dynamic with DJ is really adorable. Their faces may be a little overexpressive at times, but I like it. They leave for the weekend and tell him that the babysitter is on the way, and then we meet <laughs> Chowder. Chowder is extremely excited for the Halloween festivities like trick-or-treating, but DJ is far too focused on his own imagination and fears. He tells Chowder that he won't go trick-or-treating, which like, dude, come on, come on. You know what I would give to go trick-or-treating again? I will never get to experience the ignorant bliss of walking up to a stranger's house and getting candy again. I'm nearly 25 with a back pain and a full beard that something as childish as trick-or-treating feels like a complete lifetime ago. Anyways, after playing a little basketball, the ball accidentally bounces into Nebercracker's lawn. They run toward it before stopping in their tracks from fear. The ball looms yards away with a mix of dirt and entangled pipes below. The only thing separating them from fun is fear. When DJ attempts to run for the ball, Nebercracker notices and runs after him. Nebercracker yells at DJ to stay away, but while inherently angry, there's a huge hint of sadness in his words, begging him to stay away rather than ordering him to. It's a great voice performance by Steve Buscemi that really elevates this character. Through his outrage, Nebercracker has a heart attack as we zoom in through DJ's eyes as he collapses on top of him, lifeless. As the ambulance drags him away, his hands grace the tops of the grass. The grass almost 
almost reaching back to grab him and not let him go. DJ picks up a key that is dropped and the two boys look at the house contemplating what just happened. As we look from inside the house through glass cracking in between them and covering DJ's neck. This whole intro is stunning. It's somber, it's warm, there's a presence of something on the horizon that just ooh, gives me the chill. Soon, DJ's babysitter Elizabeth arrives, who is a cool goth girl that rules over DJ with an iron fist, taking control of the house while he has to suffer with the fact that he might have led an old man to his death. As he goes up to his room, you can see a fire billowing from the chimney of the house, a fire that wasn't there before, a fire that Nebercracker never started. As DJ lays down to sleep, the house casts a huge shadow through the window with a massive hand appearing maliciously over DJ. This part is my favorite part. He wakes up to a phone call with no one on the other end. Calling it back, he hears it ring from an echo across the street inside the house. He peers through the window, heart racing, nothing but the cold silence of the night. <laughs> Boom! A man by the name of Bones scares DJ in a Halloween mask. I love the pure no holds bar fear that this movie pushes through DJ in this moment. The consequences of his altercation with Nebercracker lead for his mind to run wild. This movie's genuine approach to slow building scares is fantastic. We see Elizabeth and Bones downstairs and soon Bones is thrown out with him in a drunken state. He walks towards the house across the street throwing his beer bottle on the lawn reflecting how tiny he is inside. Look at the tiny man, look at him, he's so tiny. The house opens its door with a glowing red kite reminiscent of one from his childhood, he lumbers to the door and is pulled inside. Cold and chilling. DJ and Chowder hang out at a nearby construction yard where Chowder messes with an excavator. A little too obvious of a setup for the finale, but eh, it's whatever. DJ tells Chowder of the house feeling haunted and like something's wrong, and Chowder messes with him by crawling up to the front porch. Chowder antagonizes and eggs on both DJ and the house, even ringing the doorbell, which is the final straw. The house opens its windows like huge glowing eyes from a beast. The wood cracks and creaks and reveals sharp teeth and a rug for a tongue. The house the house is alive. The house is angry. The house is a monster house. <laughs> the kids run away until the next morning where we meet Jenny, a smart girl hustling her way to sell some candy in a neighborhood. The babysitter buys some chocolate and walks in on DJ and Chowder obsessively watching the house. They've done gross boy things like peeing in bottles instead of going to the bathroom, a really fun moment of just kids messing around being gross and obsessing over something insane. The boys soon see Jenny on the telescope and the music swells with the both of them instantly swooning. They see her start to walk up to the house across the street and run to warn her. She doesn't believe them, of course, until the house sees this as an opportunity to try and claim another victim. And in a fun but scary scene, the sidewalks lift her and carry her towards the house in almost an amusement park kind of way. It's, it's just so cool. And as soon as Elizabeth opens the door to look outside, boom, the house satisfyingly turns everything back to normal in a quick fashion. The boys then do their best to explain to Jenny what she just saw, leading for her to be part of the group by experience. The house taunts them with Chowder's basket ball which is so funny and then goofy dumb cops pull up they try telling the cops about the house but of course they don't believe them the cops are just the true ripe a-holes that you're just looking for something to happen to the kids then go find a guy who might know more about the house and this part while kind of iconic in its gift format i don't think it really works with the movie it breaks a good flow in favor of having some fun goofy character and while funny it just doesn't fit that well in my opinion but you know what does fit learning you always need to fit learning in your life which is why this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of amazing classes for people wanting to explore new skills and get lost in a world of creativity. They have classes on graphic design, UI UX design, creative writing, marketing, web development, and so much more. This week I've been watching a class on Blender and how to model my very first 3D object. The aspect of learning 3D modeling has always interested me, and this class is absolutely perfect at explaining step by step what to do. Skillshare can even benefit you and your freelancing with creative career focused classes. So whether you're someone looking for a new hobby, a craft master, or just pick up new skills, use my link in the description to sign up for Skillshare. The first 500 people to use my link in the description actually get 30 days free and you also get 40% off your first year of Skillshare. Just use my link in the description to sign up for Skillshare today. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now back to the video. The kids then plan a way to take down the house and 
can stop its creepy torment. They steal drugs, they get weapons, they prepare for war. We even get a really great transition through one of DJ's photos to the creepy trees that surround the house. They plan to drug the house from the inside with cough medicine, a goofy, almost no actual thought out plan clearly made by children. It's fun. When they attempt their plan, the cops once again show up halting everything. And through a funny sequence of events, the clueless cops end up arresting the kids and throwing them in a cop car. After doing so, they start to hear suspicious things from inside the house. They go to investigate until they're attacked. Side note, I love how comically large this cop's gun is. Not only is the movie not scared to be genuinely terrifying for children, but it also just straight up has a huge gun like this, which is so funny. After the two cops are pretty much eaten alive, the house takes this as an opportunity to capture the kids lifting the cop car right into its mouth. They all narrowly escape with the house thinking it succeeded by consuming all three of them. But now, the kids are stuck inside. Darkness surrounds them in this abandoned home. With long stretching hallways and wallpaper chipping and rotten, it's a terrifyingly empty home. The only thing that illuminates their surroundings are the flashlights from their toy guns. Which is really fun that a toy is the only thing bringing some warmth to these kids. I like that. They come across some explosives, which is something just brushed off by Chowder and the crew and no doubt flew over everyone's head as a kid, but especially upon rewatch, as I've gotten older, this is a great touch to what ties in with Nebercracker as a character. We also learn of his old wife with photos on the wall of them together in love. Who is this wife? What happened to her? Did Nebercracker actually eat her and kill her? The kids soon learn the anatomy of the home in a terrifying way, with a hanging chandelier uvula and a terrifying wooden esophagus. Soon as they begin to explore, they all fall right through a hole in the floor towards the basement. This basement is filled to the brim with children's toys. Wall to wall, it takes the innocent fun of toys and creates a terrifying pit of lost joy. Above is almost an intestine-like maze. In the toy room, they discover a cage closed in by a heart-shaped lock. DJ tries the key that he picked up from the ground earlier, and inside, they come to find almost a shrine surrounding a cemented corpse of Nebercracker's wife. Terrifying, cold, lacking of all life, whatsoever. DJ trips and falls onto the cemented face nose to nose as it causes it to cave in with horrifying imagery, revealing a long, decomposed skeleton. The house can feel this and acts upon it by using its mechanical inner workings to capture each of them and bring them back up to the main floor, attempting to eat them all again. But as they're all about to be eaten alive, Jenny saves them all by jumping onto uvula, making the house regurgitate and throw up. They all feel defeated and plan to give up on fighting the home until Nebercracker is alive and well and rushes to check on his home. He sees the anger being shown through the house and does his best to calm it down, almost like speaking to a terrible, awful beast into submission. Nebercracker then learns that they were all inside of the home and reveals to each of them the story of his wife and through a beautifully touching backstory, we see how they came to meet. He found her in a circus that bullied her to no end. He was the first to offer her an escape and she took it. They tried building a life together, a house together, a home together. But still, they could not escape the bullying from the rest of the world, especially children. And during one terrible day, she fell to the bottom of the home, cementing herself and her soul to its very nature. This has led Nebercracker to spend his days, his life, coping with a monster. The woman he loved was no more, and while he has done his best to care for her memory and love her even past her end, he always had to keep her in check so she would not harm others. She was a product of a terrible life that soon fell on to him. And even in his old age, he has done his best to protect not just the kids of the neighborhood, but also his true love. DJ then recognizes Nebercracker's heart, and the house gets angry angry at this. It breaks free of the dirt and chases all of them down, using trees to lift itself up and run after them. They run towards the construction yard, and the house ignores Nebercracker and just goes after the kids. When it gets really close to them, about to eat them, a brick is thrown at the house in the same fashion as it was always thrown at Constance, this time by Nebercracker. He does not want the kids to get hurt, and in fact, the dynamite we saw earlier, he plans to finally use to bring down the house once and for all. This all culminates in a huge battle sequence with Chowder using the excavator from earlier, Jenny giving DJ a kiss, which is kind of random, and DJ throwing Nebercracker's dynamite right into the heart of the home to destroy it 
once and for all. And in one final moment, we watch two true loves dance together as one of them finally gets to say goodbye. This moment is beautiful and only takes 10 seconds to really hit your heart. After years and years of holding on and not moving on, we get to witness a touching and fleeting moment of a final goodbye that allows this old man to finally let go. He jumps for joy because he is free. Free of having to protect kids year after year, but also free from spending his days coping with the loss of his wife. And in a nice touching ending, the horrific toy room is repurposed to return so many toys to so many people in the neighborhood. And in one final moment, they run to go trick-or-treating while they still can. Do it, guys. Do it. Get the candy. I never will be able to again. Just do, do it for me. And that's Monster House. A beautiful, terrifying, touching story about loss and innocence, imagination, and terrifying reality. While not completely perfect, there are some elements that don't work, like Elizabeth never really being seen again after the first third of the movie, or the random pizza guy, or some of the jokes being pretty dated. I can look past all of this because it represents such a pivotal moment in my childhood that I will never get to experience again. My imagination will never craft explanations for things I don't understand. Now it's nothing but harsh reality. And I think that's something Something I really need to work on with myself. I've spent the last couple of years of my life hung up on my childhood, my nostalgia, my golden moments, and I've just been too afraid to let it all go. I'm too afraid to show the real me. I think Monster House is a beautiful film in its simplicity. The comedy is simple, but a lot of it is really funny. The story doesn't try to overdo its deep metaphors, but instead lets it all happen naturally and move on naturally. And maybe that's just what I need to do. I need to move on. I need to grow up or maybe I just need to adapt and appreciate the prospect of new opportunities while still remaining childlike at heart. It feels good to still get chills up my spine from a children's animated movie. The genuinely scary moments in this with a beautiful direction still really gets to me. Maybe I need to move on from the things that bring me down over and over again and embrace the idea of new things. I just need to stop being in my head. I need to stop putting myself in this box I'm too afraid to escape from. I just need to let go. Ooh.